everybody. How's everybody today? Okay. We're jumping into the first part of our message series entitled Seven Churches of Revelation. And I got to tell you, uh, there's no time that I have ever really looked at this book and thought, man, how relevant in my life. As we just literally got off the tail end of a pandemic, I remember at the beginning, everybody was like, pastor, is this it, right? And everybody's wondering, hey, is this all gonna come, you know, uh, bring us to the, these end times? Is this part of God's plan? And, you know, certainly we know God's sovereign, right? So God allowed it to happen, but where does it fit in? Nobody really knew. And then the inflation goes up and we got wars in Europe. People are talking about a third world war. I know on TikTok, there's, there's TikTok reels that uh, people are like, hey, I got a letter and I'm being drafted and young adults are nervous and scared and everybody's wondering, is this it? Is this the end times? Is this what Jesus spoke about in scripture? Is this what I've been told about my whole life in the book of Revelation? And if you have none of that background, maybe you're spiritually searching today. You don't really know what you believe about God, but you're like, man, this is really scary and I need hope. And right now, if I'm not putting my hope in God, the only hope we have is to put our hope in people and hope that they make right choices. But how many of you know the wisdom of men can't solve the problems we're in? right? It just can't. So if you're putting your hope in people and relationships and government and leaders, man, we're, we're going to be left, uh, we're going to be left frustrated and we're going to be let down. So, so as I look at the book of Revelation, I'm like, wow, this book has so much relevance to me, but yet it's actually the most misunderstood book in all of scripture because there's a lot of imagery that made sense in the first and second century, that doesn't really make sense to us today. So people, without doing some research, we look at the book of Revelation, and if you go online, there's a lot of bad teaching about the book of Revelation. There's a lot of people uh, uh, saying, hey, I got this prophetic gift, and this is what God is showing me about the book of Revelation, and yet it was Jesus's revelation. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So what can we expect from this message series? Jesus wrote seven letters to seven real churches that really existed. One of the questions that we've, uh, people have asked themselves is where does America show up in the book of Revelation? When we talk about these first, these letters Jesus wrote in chapter uh, two and three, you know, what countries do they represent? Well, in fact, though those are prophetic letters that have relevance for you and I today as believers, it actually goes back to legitimate churches that were there at the beginning of this Christianity journey, this Christianity movement. These were churches that existed in what was known as Asia Minor, right? So these were real churches and these letters were addressing real issues in this time. Asia Minor is actually, uh, uh, today it's, it's known as Turkey. Check out this picture. Um, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> sorry about the, uh, some of the uh, graphic issues we're having. They're working on it in the back. So, so in modern day Turkey, what you're gonna notice is that these churches actually uh, look like a horseshoe in the map. And really what that horseshoe was, there it goes. You guys can see it, right? Um, that, that horseshoe actually was a trading route. It was a postal route that was used by the Roman Empire. So strategically, where did the early church plant churches? along the trading and along the po postal route. For what purposes? It was easy to plant a church there. So these were legitimate churches that were, man, they were growing. Some of them were prosperous. Some of them were really struggling. And Jesus writes a letter to them. And I think we have to clear up some confusion. What we're gonna talk about in this message series over the next seven weeks, each week is gonna talk about a new letter Jesus wrote to one of these churches. We have to understand its significance. It's written to a real church with real issues. And the reality is those letters, again, have relevance for your life and my life here today. So we're going to talk about what we know is fact about the book of Revelation and not a whole lot of theory and a lot of that fluff and bad teaching that's out there. So as we jump in, we got to actually set the context. So here John is. John had not seen Jesus in many decades. He's in prison on the island of Patmos. He's actually the last apostle alive. Everybody else has been martyred. And here he is in his latter years. And we're going to open up with the uh, book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. Chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ to which God gave him to show, him, uh, to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending an angel to his servant John. Let's just stop there. So you haven't seen Jesus in many decades. Jesus grabs hold of him and gives him what is known as this book of Revelation. What does Revelation mean? It's a uh, picture of the future. It's to, it means to be revealed by divine purpose. So Jesus is giving this divine revelation to John for the purposes of equipping you and I, the church, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Say blessed. 
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take heart uh, what is written in it because the time is near. You are blessed simply by being here today. So don't miss the next seven weeks, right? Because you're going to be blessed. I'm blessed for sharing it with you. But why are we blessed? Because it's about preparation. Because Jesus knew what was to come. And man, the church is going to be afraid. People are going to be nervous. And Jesus is like, hey, I'm giving you a heads up so that you can be prepared. Remember this, the book of Revelation, a lot of Christians have misunderstandings about it. We think it's the bad news book. We think it's the scary book. Hey, I don't read that. That's terrifying. But the book of Revelation is actually hope to the church because it's the promise of redemption. It's the promise of renewal. Jesus already forgave our sins, but he's coming back. This is the hope of the church. This is the blessed hope that we're gonna see our Lord and Savior in the clouds coming for his church. And when judgment comes, judgment's not on you. You're actually spared from judgment. So if you're sitting here today and you're like, hey, but but I'm not a Christian, but I want that. What does the word say that Man, this is made possible through Jesus Christ, through the forgiveness of sins. That was, that was why God, the second member of the Trinity, Trinity, left heaven to come to earth because the wages of sin is death, Scripture says, which means if you've fallen short, if you've sinned once, you have no hope of salvation. This is why we, we wear shame and guilt. Some of us have walked all our lives feeling guilt and shame, feeling dirty. How could God use me? I'm not good enough for God. You know what I've done, right? We've all, we've all struggled with those feelings at one point or another. And in that one moment of surrender to Jesus, the acknowledgement that he's the Lord and Savior of my life, all of that is taken away from you. That's the good news of the gospel. Then Jesus, right, he rose from the dead. He ascends into heaven. What a promise that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and empower you to do great and amazing things. We are in right now what is called the age of the church, the age of grace. God wants to save as many as he possibly can. God's desire is that everybody would know his son and the salvation through Jesus Christ. We're in an age of grace, but the age of grace does have an expiration for the world. And what does scripture tell us? That the heavens and the earth will pass away, but God will make a new heavens and a new earth. And those who abide in Christ will rule and reign with him forever. You don't need to fear the antichrist. You don't need to fear the devil. They can't touch you. You may have to go through some difficulty, right? We got to walk this journey. But how many of you know we don't walk it alone? God is with us. He is for us. And nothing and no one can take you from the palm of his hand. So what God, what he called you to, he's going to see you through, right? He's going to walk you through that. So verse 4. So John, to the seven churches of the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him uh, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom of priests, to serve God uh, and and Father, to be... uh, to be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. What does all of this mean for you and I? Jesus knew what would happen. When the world starts to get dark, you're going to be shaken. When famine comes, when disaster comes, when war comes, when the gas prices go through the roof, you're going to be shaken. You're going to worry about your bills. You're going to worry about your household. You're going to be overcome with worry. So what does Jesus do before he even writes this letter, before he delivers the fullness of the revelation? He's like, let me anchor you back in. Let me remind you of who I am. Let me remind you of what I've done. Let me remind you that I am your salvation, not your political leaders, not your comforts in this life. Gas prices may go up, but I'm your provider. Jesus literally starts the book of Revelation with his resume in your life, reminding you because he wants you when you feel shaken to anchor back into truth. So many of us, what we anchor into is the media, CNN, Fox News, and we get terrified. And how many of you know uh, fear sells? It sells, it's fear mongering because they know that if they share with you more negative things, you're gonna watch more. Why? Because human beings by nature, we wanna self-preserve, we wanna wanna be safe. So if you ever wondered why you start going on news binging, notice it's not good news. Why don't they put up great news in the news? Because it doesn't sell. But when we fear something, we get so consumed with our own survival that we start obsessing over it. And what happens is a root of fear and anxiety grows. That is not from God. 
And then we just want to hear more, and we start listening to talk radio. And I'm not saying knowing the news is bad. Listen, I watch the news, but in a healthy amount. I have boundaries around it. Why? Because I know what it will do to me. It creates spiritual cancer in my life, and it will pull me fear and anxiety, which is not from God. It's a tool of the enemy. will pull me from God. So Jesus said, let me spare you from all of that. Before I tell you what's going to happen, let me tell you who is, who was, and who shall ever be in your life. I got you. It's a book of hope for the church. And Jesus, what he's trying to convey to you is when faith with the scary unknown, Jesus wants you to trust in him. So then John is now conveyed, hey, John, this is what I want you to do. I want you to write down everything you hear and everything you see from me. Write it down on this scroll to the seven churches at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, um, uh, Thyatria, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then we're going to jump to verse 12, Revelation 1. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. What we're going to understand here is we're going to see some imagery. And we're going to talk about what that imagery meant in the early church. And what we're also going to see is a picture of Jesus far different than the picture you and I imagine. So many of us, John himself, what did he see? He saw a humble servant who came, who suffered, who had no place to lay his head. And he served, and he was sacrificed, and he rose from the dead. But what we're about to see is a very different picture of Jesus. The Jesus that walked this earth in his earthly ministry was a humble servant. But the Jesus who's coming back on the clouds, he's a mighty king who's going to rule, reign, and judge. And he's going to have his victory, and the church is going to have the victory. It's not bad news for you and I. So he sees the seven golden lampstands. What do the seven golden lampstands represent? represents the church because the church the imagery about the church being the light of the world and the seven lampstands are those seven churches that letters are being written to verse 13 among the lampstands I saw someone like the son of man Jesus dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest royalty what I see is a king right? That's what he's saying. And the hair on his head was as white like wool and white as snow. And his eyes were like a blazing fire. Holiness represents here. Righteousness is represented here. Wisdom and knowledge and truth with the colors and the, and the flaming eyes. Verse 15, and his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, uh, he had seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance and glory. With, uh, when I saw him, I fell at my feet as though dead. No doubt you fell like you were dead. I would be like, what? Uh, I can't even look, right? I can't even look. But what's the deal with the sword? The sword represents the sword of the spirit, double-edged sword. It's able to judge the intentions of the heart. The sword exposes, the sword discerns, and the sword cuts through the persona. The sword represents Jesus' knowledge. The seven stars, they represent, now let me tell you about this, they represent angels, right? In the Hebrew and the Greek, the word angel is also understood as messenger or someone who teaches or carries a divine message. So in this context, some people think it means an angel sent from God. But in the context, what it's actually talking to is people who lead the church. That would be elders, that would be teachers, that would be pastors. So let's continue to go on here. Then he placed uh, his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Right, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. Let's stop on that. Man, what was? What was, right? What Jesus is saying is, understand when you read the book of Revelation, it, it, this whole revelation, this divine inspiration, it's gonna convey to you what is actually happening right now. It's not just a prophecy for the future. It certainly is that, yes, but it's also what's going on today. And so many of us as Christians kind of misunderstand that. We read the book of Revelation and we think it's only for what's ahead. But Jesus right here is telling us, no, this book is about what's happening here and the whole entire process ahead. And that's important because it helps us to understand this letter correctly. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven uh, golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angels or messengers, right, is what it means. Uh, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. See, so many of us get this approach wrong. You see, when we, when we look at the book of Revelation, again, we, we want to dissect it. And it's not wrong to study the Bible, but sometimes our heart is wrong because we're really driven by fear and anxiety. And what we want to do is we tune in to the wrong sources. There's a lot of really bad teaching out there. 
You see, and what happens is this. Scripture actually tells us something really convicting. Revolution 22, 18, 19. Uh, it's a warning from God. And the reason why I have to share this with you is because you guys got to be well prepared that in those later days, bad teaching is going to come. People are going to say, hey, I know the Bible says this, but I, I had a dream last night, and this is what I saw about the Antichrist, and this is what I saw about the end times, and this is what's going to happen to the church. They treat Jesus' revelation as if it were inadequate, as if Jesus didn't give you enough. Well, let's just stop right there. If Jesus gave anything inadequate, he would cease being God. You see, anyone who treats anything Jesus gave as not being enough or somehow lacking or somehow inadequate, the wrong is on them, and they're probably inspired by the evil one or some false motive of the flesh. But what does scripture say, just to prove that point? Uh, Revelation twenty two eighteen. 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. So when somebody comes to me and says, Armando, I got to tell you what I saw. Right away, I'm like, you better be careful. You better be careful what you say. And I'm going to be careful what I choose to let in. Because you know what? If you're trying to add to this thing, you're in sin. Verse 19. And if anyone takes word, words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll. So Jesus is saying, hey, when it comes to this prophecy that belongs to me, that I gave you, if you take away from it, you're wrong. If you add to it, you're wrong. It's perfect. It's exactly what I want my church to know. Church, you don't need to go far seeking for truth. All you got to do is open up your word. And you want to be careful because as the world gets darker, as we go to there, what does scripture say? That even from amongst us, false prophets came. They were like wolves. So you got to be careful, even people in the church who are not bearing good fruit. Well, listen, don't get it wrong or twisted here. I believe in a prophetic word. What I don't believe in is macro prophecy. What is that? It's adding to the word of God. That in and of itself is a sin. If you say, hey, you know, God gave me a dream and I have a, a, a word for you. This is what God wants to encourage you with. You know what? I'm going to test that. I'm, I'm not going to receive it right away. I'm going to test it. I'm going to put it up against scripture. I'm going to confirm it, make sure God spoke it. And if it's found to be true, amen, hallelujah. But if you start coming to me with a new revelation, something you've added to the Bible, hold up, wait a minute. I'm not having that conversation. Let me correct you and maybe it'll save your soul. You guys, you, you can go on any social media platform, YouTube videos. There's, there's people calling themselves prophets all over the place. Be careful who you tune into because who has your ear has influence over your life. So Jesus, Jesus um, then he writes these letters to the church. Today we're going to look at a letter to the church at Ephesus. So if you've got your Bibles, you guys can turn with me to uh, Revelation 2. But let's see the letter Jesus actually wrote the church today. This is what scripture says. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel, to the messenger, to the teacher, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his hand and walks among the seven lampstands. That's, that's really important to understand. Jesus is saying, those stars are in my hands. These lampstands, man, these are my churches. You see, when, when, <laughs> when people say, oh, that's my church, I mean, we know what they mean, right? That they go there. But ultimately, the church doesn't belong to us. Jesus is saying, they're mine. I sustain them. I hold them up. I provide for them. I feed them. Nothing will come against them. They're a light because I've positioned them there. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not I have, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So scary to think about that. Like, is Jesus really saying here that a toxic church, he will remove it? You see, what Jesus is really saying here is, if you don't get this right, I'm not going to allow this church that represents my name, that I hope brings this light, this gospel message to the ends of the earth, I'm not going to have you desecrating what is holy. I'm not going to have you hurting people. I'm not going to have you creating a toxic environment that's going to push people away from God. I will remove you before you do that. This is a very different picture of Jesus many of us are used to. We think of God when we think of Jesus. We think all grace, all forgiveness, and he is all that, but he's all that and more. He's also a judge. 
He's also righteous. He's also holy. And he expects his church to be. Now, let me say this. We can't accomplish perfection in and of ourselves. The truth is, I mean, even this holiness, righteousness, it's not possible for us as people. It's made possible through Jesus' sacrifice and the indwelling of the Spirit. What Jesus is really saying here to the church is if you don't humble yourself, if you don't go back and, and, and live for me and you have wrong motives, if you don't change that, eventually my grace for that church is going to run out and I'm going to take that lampstand from its place. You know what's sad? None of those churches exist today. Not one of them is still there today. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat uh, from the tree of life, which is in, uh, the paradise of God. Man, you know, what a, what a hard word to hear. Jesus opens it with, let me affirm you and validate you. And let me share with you what you need to change. You, you know, when we think about that, he has the right to rebuke the church. He has the right to correct the church. You know, it's kind of like Undercover Boss. How many of you have ever seen Undercover Boss? You know, this show is uh, really a cool show. I like watching it, uh, certainly clips of it. And it's really about the CEO, this boss, who goes undercover, right? And he goes undercover and he goes to become a, like a first-rung employee. And, and he experiences what life is like as an employee. Then at the end of the show, he shows himself. Hey, guys, you know what? I'm not the employee. I have some things you've done that I like. Let me share them with you. But man, you've done some things that I hate. Yeah, we, you've done some things I need to change. And he brings correction. Understand that Jesus corrects the church because he loves the church. He doesn't threaten, hey, I'm going to take that lamb stand away. It's a word of correction. And if you don't heed my command, you're not going to be blessed. That's the whole idea about rules and boundaries that God gives us. They're to save us. It's not about control. So many of us, you know, turn our hearts away from God because we're like, oh, he just wants to control and run my life. But the reality is he's trying to protect you and I from what we do to ourselves. This is why he says to forgive. It's so satisfying when you're, when you're offended and hurt not to offer forgiveness because somehow there's a satisfaction, but it becomes a cancer in your life. And Jesus is asking you and I to do those things. He's asking us to surrender. Jesus has a word for the church. So if Jesus wrote a, church, a, 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 a letter to Fusion Church today, what would he say? What would Jesus say if he wrote a letter specifically to you? As I pondered that this week, I thought, man, we're a church plan of three years back in the movie theater. Our, our setup team gets up crazy early to set this up. I know I'm up at 5 a.m. And, you know, sometimes you get caught up in the work of ministry. And I, and I imagine, you know, Jesus would say, well done. You guys work hard. You're faithful. You're committed. It, man, you get up and you sacrifice over and over. But would he have something against us? You know, we do great events, right, for the community. We want to reach the community for Jesus. You know, we, we've reached the community. People get saved but would he have something against us? Would there be some sort of correction? And, and you know what I will tell you? I, I've gone through these peaks and valleys, right? And, and my walk with the Lord. I remember when I got saved, guys, it was magical. It really was. When I first got saved, I remember worshiping Jesus and I felt like he was right there with me. I would go to these worship services. I would sing my heart out. About three, four years passed, right? In my early walk. And it just didn't feel that way anymore. I started serving, started getting caught up with the serving in ministry. I started getting tired. I started getting overwhelmed. I started uh, getting frustrated. And, and there were these valley moments in my walk that I recognized, you know, something's changed. I don't, I don't experience God the way I used to. It doesn't feel the same. And, and then the Lord would come to me just like he did with this church. And this is what he says, because there's something to be said about when your love grows old, sometimes your heart grows cold. You need to understand that. When your love grows old, sometimes your heart goes cold. This may just save your relationship before we get to Jesus' redirection and correction. Your relationship with the Lord, maybe with your romantic partner, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your siblings. You see, when we're in relationships for a long time, we start to take them for granted. You see, and that's what I did. When I first got saved, I worshiped God. It was amazing. I started serving, and I got so caught up with the work of ministry, I started to forget my first love a little bit. And then I was wearing the weight of ministry, but you know what? It just didn't feel the same. And so many of us, we feel that way in relationships. Hey, I dated. It was amazing. We were into each other. And then all of a sudden, we got married, right? Love is blind. Marriage reveals all things. And it changed. Well, you're not the same guy. You're not the same girl anymore. Something happens. Something changed in the relationship. This is what Jesus says. Hold this against you. You were forsaken 
the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove that lampstand from its place. So what is Jesus saying to us? It's really two things here. He's saying repent. What does repent mean? It means you got to acknowledge. you got to understand, God, what have I done that has changed our relationship? Remember, when love grows old, the heart can grow cold. You see, what I did was I got too busy. I allowed things to start taking me my time, my focus, my attention from my love with Jesus to my working for Jesus. And that was a valley moment. That happens in your marriages. Look, how many of us, man, we date, it's all exciting. Then you get married, you get caught up with life, career, jobs, kids, paying the bills, and then now it feels like we're cohabitating. What Jesus is saying is you need to repent. You need to acknowledge what it is that changed in me, my focus, my time, my attention. And then he says, return back to the things you did at first. You know, to this day, I've been married 23 years. To this day, when Joe Marie's working, I call and text her probably four or five times a day. You know why? Because I'm really a needy person. No. <laughs> because that's what I did when we were dating. And I'm a little needy, Carlos. Because I want her to know I'm intentional. My kids go to college, Alex, Kayla, Gabby, and uh, I call and text them almost daily, or they call and text me, sometimes multiple times. Why? Because I want you to know your dad's thinking of you. And you know what? The time that works best for me is when I'm in the car. I almost pair it. I know that when I'm in the car, this is what I'm going to do because I'm intentional, right? Uh, Valentine's Day, since Jeremy and I were dating since eighth grade, I've known her a long time. I never took her out on Valentine's Day. I cook surf and turf at home. That's what we do, right? And that is kind of the tradition. That's my holiday, and I provide that for my wife, and then it was my kids, and everybody looks forward to it. You know, I'm intentional about spending time talking with her. Even when we don't have something planned, hey, come with me, let's go out for a ride, and we spend our time talking and engaging. Why? Because I'm still into you. You see, if I stop those things, if I change those things, the relationship would grow cold. She, of course, does the same, and there's reciprocation. But some of you sit in marriage relationships, dating relationships, and you're like, I I feel like we're so distant now. You're distant because you changed. We can't point the finger at the other person. They got to own their stuff too. They probably changed too. But Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to be right with me, you need to remember what you used to do and go back to doing those things because here's the truth that modern psychology thinks they figured out. But Jesus told us a long time ago, that your feelings follow your behaviors and choices. That's the reality. You want to have this deep encounter with God? You want to maintain that in your life? Man, you got to return back to the things you did at first. So what did I have to do in those valley moments? Man, I'm intentional now, not just in my devotion reading. Like I have devotions outside of my study. What's my study? It's preparing for something like today. But what's my devotion? This is my time with with you and me, God. And I'll do that before my study. Why? Because I got to feed me first and I got to feed this relationship. I put on worship music and I worship my way through it. Why? Because God, I want intimacy with you. I'm intentional about serving. Why? Because it keeps me connected to Jesus as my vine. That's where my nourishment comes from. These are choices. But those valley moments... They only happened in my life because I changed. I got caught up. And so many of us, we get caught up in two ways, right? Either by choice. You know, we fill our lives with too much busyness and it takes us away from what's most important, which is relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with others. Or life gets so busy and we don't own our schedule. And we get taken for this long ride, right? And then all of a sudden we look back and we're like, man, how far I've come. You see, I almost feel like this church to Ephesus, it almost sounded like a surprise. Like how far, look at how far you've fallen. If I would have heard that, I would have been like, oh snap, I fell that far. Like, did they, were they even aware of it? Look at what Jesus was affirming in them. They were hard workers. They were all about the ministry, but they lost their first love. Sometimes you can lose your love for somebody by by getting caught up and taking them for granted because your life is too busy. What is Jesus really saying to us here? He says, repent and do the things that you did at first. If you don't repent, there's cost to that. Guys, we make it so complicated. It's so easy. Repent and do what we once did. Your feelings will always follow your choices. Let's go to verse 6. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, uh, which I also hate. That was actually a cult, okay? The Nicolaitans were a lot of cults at this time. Nicolaitans were perverting um, the 
you know, what we understand as the Trinity. They had some false beliefs. They were pulling people from the church and the church of Ephesus was plagued by this cult, but there were other cults. And what Jesus is really saying here is, hey, you guys, this you have for you, you're not getting caught up with the idolatry of life. That's a huge threat to us. So many things are begging for your time and for your attention. And you see what you, let me say it this way. What captivates your attention captures your heart. You serve what you focus on because you give it all your time and your attention. It captivates your heart. What has your heart today? You see, as I look at this, this world we live in and how dark it is, and I try to reconcile what the, what the word says, I know it's a book of hope for my life and for your life. And how do I reconcile it? Jesus is preparing me for difficult times. What is that preparation really? Preparing us to be right with him. Showing us how to live right with God. The fullness of what God wants in our life. He's bringing us to a point of preparation. That's what the book of Revelation is for the church. It's to remind you that you're good, but to also prepare you and your heart. And for the world, those without Christ, it's a book of judgment. But God doesn't want to judge the world. He will. The judgment was reserved for Satan and all the fallen angels but he's going to judge sin. And he's saying, would you return back to me? So many of us are sitting here right now and we're like, I remember how rich it felt. And and right now I'm talking to those that have been in the church for some time. Look, if you're new and you're excited, here's something you want to hold on to. Whatever it is you're doing now, keep doing it. Because you want to destroy a relationship, it's easy. All we got to do is stop doing the things we did at first. Destroys relationships. But what you're doing now Let it be your focus. I'm going to read. I'm going to study. I'm going to be in small groups. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to feed myself spiritually. I'm going to connect with Jesus. Don't stop that. But for the rest of us who have been in Christ for so long, and you're like, I used to serve. I used to worship. I don't do my devotion anymore. I I transiently show up to church. What is God speaking to you? What is he asking you to remove from your life? What is he asking you to place into your life? He's trying to prepare you. He's trying to prepare you. Guys, this is really a moment, I think, for you that is about return and repentance. That's really what it is. You, you want to be well prepared for whatever's going on in Russia and the Ukraine and inflation and all those things. How do I well prepare myself? I'm going to tell you I had to repent of something. I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. People, how many of you struggle with anxiety time to time? That means you also feed it. Yeah. I fed it. So what did I have to do? Because I recognized that news media at some point many years ago in my life, probably about eight, 10 years ago, was a complete idol. I would wake up, put it on. I would watch it all morning. I would listen to it on the way to work. I would listen to it, watch it before I went to bed. I would Google it. I would talk to people about it. And uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was sick. I was sick. I'm sorry if I sound like you right now. That was a lot, right? You judging me right now? I got issues. Don't worry. You'd be judging all day. So... So I had to recognize, God, I repent for doing that because you did not give me a spirit of fear. God, give me the strength not to create a spirit of fear. I had to put that aside, put boundaries around it. What do I do today? I I listen to the news for 10 to 20 minutes in the morning and I look at it for about 10 minutes at night. Everything you need to know will happen in 20 minutes, I promise you. And then it just recycles itself with different opinions and different words and it's all the same. But why do I do that? Because that's, I'm not gonna feed anxiety, I'm gonna feed faith. I'm going to make sure I'm walking right with God. I'm going to worship and spend my time focused on my relationship with God and others than I am focused on the spiritual cancer of my life. That's what God has moved my heart to remove and also move my heart of what to implement in my life. What is God speaking to you today? How do you need to return back to God, returning back to your first love. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come uh, come and enjoy service with us, and if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.